Hello, dear ones. Father Peter John coming to you from All Saints Orthodox Church in Bloomington, Indiana. Christ is in our midst. I was thinking today about St. Erasmus, the monk of the Kiev Caves. Um, maybe you've never heard of him. His name is not exactly a household name. You probably don't have any friends named Erasmus, unless perhaps you do. But St. Erasmus <clears throat> was a monk who had great wealth before uh, leaving the world and entering monasticism. And he took that wealth and he gave it to, the, to, to finish and beautify the church in the monastery at the Kiev Caves. And uh, because of this, because he had done this, you know, everybody who was involved with the church and the monastery knew that he had given this, all of this wealth to the monastery and to the church. And, uh, and so he had a great reputation. Well, what happened was this um, righteous and ascetic man of God uh, was tempted. The evil one came to him. Listen carefully to this. H how, how disgustingly tricky the evil one is. And he is. He's a good lawyer, right? Well, not good, but he's, he knows what he's doing. He's the accuser in chief. So the evil one came to him and said, Erasmus, you should have taken that money and given it to the poor instead of giving it to the church. Well, Erasmus didn't know what to do. The, see, the evil one was working to discourage him. What does that mean? Kur means, it's the root word in Hebrew, it means heart, kur. To discourage someone means to weaken their heart, to weaken their resolve. You know, when you say somebody is, is, is doing something and they're doing a really good job, you say, well, they're really pouring their heart into it. That's, that's the idea. So to discourage, <laughs> to discourage someone means that you're trying to, to, to have them remove their heart from the process. In other words, they really aren't in it anymore. And so that's what happened with Erasmus. He, he heard these words of the evil one, uh, and, and he believed that he had done this wrong and that his salvation was lost, that he was a lost soul. So he began to live carelessly. He stayed at the monastery. We're not given any details about his sin, but we know that he began to live a life of, of idleness and laziness and sin. And so the Lord, who loves us, loves him, sent him an illness. He was very, very sick for seven days. He couldn't see, he couldn't eat, he couldn't um, speak, and he, uh, couldn't, he could just barely breathe, little teeny shallow breaths. On the eighth day of his illness, the brothers of the monastery came and they gathered around him and they said, look at this poor sinner, this poor, idle, unrepentant man. Uh, and they were, they were pitying him. And all of a sudden, Erasmus opened his eyes and he sat up and he stood up next to the bed. He said, brothers, you're right. I am sinful. I am idle and I have lived without repentance. He said, but the Lord who loves me has given me an opportunity to repent before I die. He said, you see, uh, our brothers and fathers, uh, Anthony and Theodosius, that's Anthony, the founder of the Kiev Caves, where he lived, and Th St. Theodosius of the Kiev Caves, he said, they have appeared to me. They said they were praying for me and that uh, God would heal me so that I might repent before I die. Then the Theotokos herself appeared to me. And she said, Erasmus, because you have adorned the church of my son, you will be adorned in the kingdom of my son. And so then she told him, take up the great schema, because he had just been a simple Rasafor monk, you know, the first, uh, uh, first degree of monasticism after being a novice. Uh, she said, take up the great schema, and on the third day you will fall asleep, which means you'll die. And so he repented before his brothers there in the monastery. He confessed all of his sins shamelessly, is the word that is used. Uh, he confessed his, his sins shamelessly before them and openly. Then he went to the church at the monastery. He um, received the great schema. And on the third day, he fell asleep in the Lord. St. Erasmus of the Kiev Caves. Now, what can we learn from his life real quickly? Number one, anybody can be tempted and fall. I mean, this was a righteous man who had given away everything he owned uh, and had moved into a, a monastery and was living a life of prayer. But the devil found a way to hit him where it would hurt him and where it would discourage him, uh, which means that he suffered from pride. You know, he was susceptible because of pride. We all suffer from pride. And um, St. Erasmus fell into... Um, discouragement and the word is despondency that he fell into. 
number one. Um, number two, the Lord loves us and desires that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And the Lord loved Erasmus so much that he gave him this opportunity to wake up and repent before his death. And then the other thing, uh, which is perhaps the most powerful, is that we have to be vigilant because the devil pretended to give Erasmus true words of God, but they weren't true. They were false. It was a lie. The devil will do and say anything he can to try to knock us down, to try to, to, to damage our faith, to try to discourage us. Uh, and and he, 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 he's very effective. He's a very effective lawyer and accuser. Uh, that's, that's what the devil does. He's always done that. So he's got a lot of practice. So brothers and sisters, let us not be deceived. When we set our hands to the plow, we should not look back. When we set our hands to the plow to do something good for God, we should um, uh, pour our heart into it, do it in faith and in humility. We have to have humility. As St. Anthony the Great says, he saw all the snares of the evil one laid out before him across the world, and he cried out, Lord, who can be saved? Who can pass all of these snares? And he heard a voice that said, humility. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be.